Welcome, and in this session, I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 18. In this chapter, we're going to be talking about who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We're going to be talking about what Jesus says, what the Lord says about those who cause other people to, to sin. We're also going to be talking about the parable of the lost sheep and, excuse me, sin in the church. And we're also going to be talking about the parable of the unmerciful servant. Okay, let's get right into this. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. In that hour, in what hour? Well, we just came from Matthew chapter 17, and it was talking about paying the temple tax. Jesus just told Peter to go and, and fish, and the first fish he catches will have the payment for the, the tax right in the fish's mouth. So we're just continu continuing from that story. You need to realize that the, the original manuscripts, the original um, the original book of Matthew was not written with chapters and verses. It was written as one continuous document, no chapters and verses, not even punctuation for that matter. So in that hour, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Awesome question. Good, good, good question. Very good question. Don't you wonder what, who um, does Jesus look at, who does Jesus look for? What does Jesus look for when it comes to greatness? What is it that that causes the Lord to say that someone is the greatest? Who is the greatest according to uh, the Lord? Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest in your kingdom? Who's the greatest? Great question. I mean, if this wasn't recorded, I'm sure a lot of people would be saying, why didn't, you know, why didn't the disciples ask him this question? Or why wasn't this question actually recorded, written down? We have it. We have the question. We have the answer. Jesus, Yeshua, called a little child to himself and set him in the middle of them and said, most certainly, I tell you, unless you turn, there we are, there we go again. The concept of turning is the concept of repentance. Again, don't forget, it's the first message that Jesus preached. It's the last message that Jesus preached. He preached it throughout his ministry, throughout his life. It's the first thing he said, repent. It, the, people might say, well, that's his first word, but what about his last word? Well, look in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. Jesus said, not to the world, not to the sinners, not to just any Joe Blow off the street, but he said it to his church. He said, repent, repent, repent over and over and over again with grave and serious consequences for those who don't. I mean, seriously cut off, okay? If you don't repent. Here again, they said, Lord, who's the greatest? Who's the greatest in the kingdom? Who's the greatest in the rule of heaven in, 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 according to the, the, the point of view of heaven? And who's the greatest? Lord, tell me, who do you think is the greatest? What does it take to be the greatest person in, in heaven? He said, most certainly I tell you, unless you turn, unless you repent and become as little children. You might say, well, what did he mean by little? How do you become as little children? What In what way? Like, are you supposed to biologically reverse as a little child and become little again? What does he mean become as little children? You will in no way enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whoever therefore, now this is the answer here, this is what we're looking for, whoever therefore humbles himself as this little child. That is the way that Jesus meant that we're supposed to be like little children. We're supposed to humble ourselves as a little child. Whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So again, we got the, the concept of repentance and humility, okay? This is what Jesus wants from you. He wants you to repent. He wants you to turn. Turn. How do you repent? How do you turn? Turn from your own ways. 
Turn from your from liking sin, from loving sin, from loving to do things that God says is not good. Loving to do things that God says don't do. Turning from your own ways, turning from your own, you know, turning from yourself, so to speak, your own desires, turning to him and humbling yourself. This is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. Okay. Whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest. So this is what he's talking. This is exactly, this is the point he's making. The point is to humble yourself. Verse 5, whoever receives such a little one in my name receives me. It's that important to humble yourself as a little child. How is a child humble? Well, a child is honest. A little child, that is. A little, little, little child is very honest. Now, if, again, if you look it up in the original manuscripts, in the original Greek, in the original language, it is talking about not like a, you know, a, an adolescent child. It's not talking about an, an older child. It's talking about a child that's basically just like a, a child that just began to talk, okay? So this kind of child is very humble, very honest, okay? Um, very honest and also um, uh, very much in, in, uh, in need and knows their need, very much relying on an out in external source for everything they need, okay? They rely on an external source for everything that they need. They rely on their parents or their guardians for life. They rely on everything for life. And this is the kind of humility Jesus wants. Um, the humility that makes you want to, um, it, that it causes you to, re to rely on God for everything. Everything. Okay, that's the humility that Jesus is talking about here. Verse 6, very, very, very important. You need to really, really pay attention here. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, in other words, to sin, whoever causes them to sin, it would be better off, it would be better for him if a huge millstone were hung around his neck. A millstone is a very, very heavy rock that's used, is tied on to oxen and stuff that's used to grind wheat, okay, uh, and other grains. So it'd be better for him if a huge millstone were hung around his neck and that he, that he were sunk into the depths of the sea. So listen, it's better for you to commit suicide and go to hell more or less than it is to cause a child who believes in Jesus to sin. Think about it. How many people in the world today, especially in the Western world, how many people are telling children it's okay to do something that the Bible says it's not okay with. The Bible says that God is not okay with. In schools today, in secular TV today, in, on secular radio today, in secular music today, there's a lot of this going on where little children are being desensitized to sin, being desensitized, being told it's okay to do something that the Bible or that God very, very clearly says is wrong in the scriptures. By saying it's okay to do it when God says it's wrong, you are causing a little one to sin. And according to Jesus here, these are not my words, these are the words of Jesus. According to Jesus, you'd be better off to tie a big rock around your neck and throw yourself in the depths of the sea than to cause a little one to stumble to sin. That's serious, my friend. That's very serious. But this, this world is void. And you know what? I blame the church more than anybody else. Okay. The church, in generally speaking, the people who call themselves the church of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus, the church of Christ, whatever. The church, whatever, generally speaking, is void of the, of the fear of God. Void. The void of the words in red for the most part. When's the last time you heard the words in red really, really preached, at, you know, on, 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 uh, in your services? Verse 7, woe to the world. Now, again, woe is a word of cursing here. Here's Jesus. 
the meek and mild, so-called meek and mild, loving hippie guy, this hippie Jesus that a lot of people like to believe in, which is also the false Jesus, the loving Jesus, would never say curse to the world. But the real, true Jesus, the true Yeshua HaMashiach, out of the scriptures, the real one, called cursing to the world. Woe to the world. Curse to the world. Curses to the world. Because of occasions of stumbling. Because of the occasions of sin. Because you have so, you're so conducive to sin. Because you're so friendly to sin. Cursed are those of the world because of their conduciveness to sin. Jesus continues, for it must be that the, that the occasions come. In other words, that's just part of the big plan that there, there are temptations to sin. But woe to that person. Cursed be that person through whom that the occasion comes. Very strong words from a very strong man. Verse 8, if your hand or foot causes you to stumble. Again, Jesus is just telling you how serious sin really is. Again, when's the last time you heard this preached from, from the pulpit? When's the last time you heard this preached on TV? When's the last time you heard this, this preached on Christian radio? Verse 8, the words in red, the words of our Lord said, if your hand or foot causes you to stumble to sin, to stumble in your walk with God, in your walk with, you know, obeying the, the commandments of God. Cut it off! And cast it from you. Not Don't just cut it off, but throw it out. Throw it away from you. Get it away from... If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, Jesus said, and throw, and get it, throw it away from you. Get it as far from you as possible. That's how serious sin is to the Lord. This is not what I said. This is what Jesus said. I'm just reading the words in red. But Jesus is telling us how serious it is. And if you're a Christian, you're supposed to go by the words in red, by the way. It is better for you to enter into life maimed or crippled rather than having two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. Verse 9, for if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes and be cast into Gehenna of fire. Hell fire. See that you don't despise one of these little ones. These little ones? What little ones? The little children that believe in him. For I tell you that, hev that in heaven... Their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Wow. These angels are not just in heaven somewhere, not just, part, not just back in the, you know, sitting in the back of the crowd, so to speak, sitting far back in the bleachers, so to speak. No, they are, they are close to the Father, always seeing the face of the Father who is in heaven. It says, for the Son of Man came to save that which was lost. Again, in the NU manuscripts, the, what many to believe to be the, um, the oldest manuscripts, that verse does not exist. Verse 12, what do you think? If a man has 100 sheep and one of them goes astray, does he leave the 99? Doesn't he leave the 99 and go to the mountains and seek that? which has gone astray? If he finds it, most certainly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 which have not gone astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go, show him his fault between you and him alone. Okay? Here we got a recipe for fixing people who are against one another. When you got two people, one is against one, one has something against another person. Okay, listen to this. If you know of anybody who calls himself a Christian, who 
has got anything against anybody else, they better go by this. Okay? You, listen. Attention, please. Attention. Verse 15. Verse 15. If your brother sins against you, meaning that, again, this is, a, this is talking to the believers now. Verse 15. If, if your brother sins against you, first, go, your, go, show your, go show his fault between you and him alone. So you need to go and talk to that person face to face, one on one. The worst thing to do is go and yap about him. The worst thing to do is go and gossip or slander him. What did Jesus say to do if you got someone who'd sinned against you? Who did something that you don't like? What did he say here in verse 15? Did he say, oh, if your brother sins against you, go and slander his name behind his back? God forbid. Of course not. He said, go show him his fault between you and him alone. Okay? You need to be mature enough, if you're a Christian, especially if you're over pff, anything, over even, <laughs> even 12 years old, man, you, you should be able to do this. You need to be mature enough to say, hey, I, there's someone who did something against me. I'm going to go to that person alone. Instead of going yapping about them behind their back, gossiping or slandering them, go to that person alone and work it out with them. Do everything you can to work it out with them. That's what Jesus said. If you don't do this, you're not much of a Christian. The last half of verse 15. If he listens to you, you have gained back your brother. Wow. In other words, if he listens to you, rejoice. Congratulations. You won. Verse 16. But if he doesn't listen... Take one or two more with you. Okay, so that's when you go and you say, okay, I need to go tell someone else. Someone who's godly, someone who's trustworthy. Another, again, not someone who's going to gossip anything around or slander anybody. But take someone who is an honorable, respectful person with you. That, the mouth of, that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Okay, so that is um, Deuteronomy. Jesus is quoting here from De De Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. So let's read that here for a second. I'm just going to skip on over to Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. It says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity for, or for any sin that he sins. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall a matter be established. Okay? So that's what Jesus said. If you got something against somebody, don't just stay, stay behind and, and play a coward and not go and confront that person. And don't just mumble and grumble behind their back, but go and try to make it right with them. One-on-one. One-on-one. -on -one. If they listen, congratulations. Kudos to both of you, really, because you worked it out. If, 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 if that person doesn't listen, go take another witness, another witness, one or two more with you. Okay? Uh, that according to, and, and Jesus said, go by, go, go by the Torah here, Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the assembly, tell it to all of the rest of the believers, not to the world, not to the unbelievers. If you go yapping off and you call yourself a Christian, you go yapping off to the, to the unbelievers, about another Christian brother or sister? Shame on you. You're not much of a Christian. Shame on you. Okay? First, you need to go and work it out between you and that person alone. Do everything you can to work it out between you and that person one-on-one. -on -one. If that doesn't work, you take one or two others with you. No more. If that doesn't work, then tell it to the rest of the believers the assembly or the ecclesia, the church, okay? And that doesn't mean church as we know about it today because nowadays church is just a social club where everybody gossips anyway. Church here is talking about the real believers who really respect and honor one another and don't gossip and slander, okay? 
Verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the assembly. If he refuses to hear the assembly, also let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. What does that mean? That means cast them out. Notice that Jesus called the Gentiles the ones who were outside of the church. The ones who were not part of him. The ones who were not part of his fellowship. Because a lot of people today, they're in the church and they call themselves the Gentiles. Well, if you really got born again, you died to your Gentile self. And you got risen in Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. Okay, so if the if if him and all the you know if the rest of the believers they don't listen, then let him be to you as a gentile or a tax collector. What does that mean? Give him the boot. Don't talk to him anymore. Don't even don't even do anything with him. Don't even say hello to them. Verse eighteen. Most certainly I tell you, whatever things you bind on earth will be bound will have been bound in heaven. And whatever things you release on earth will have been released in heaven. Again, assuredly I tell you that if two of you will agree on earth concerning anything that they will ask, it will be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the middle of them. Okay, so it's very, very, it's a very, very, very powerful thing when you got two people agreeing on something together on earth, because that just penetrate, that reaches into heaven. Okay, that, that really touches heaven. Okay, verse 22, excuse me, verse 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him until seven times? Now, you got you to you realize here, you got to understand, the number seven meant a complete number. It was like an eternal number. It was like when Jesus said, or excuse me, when Peter said, how, how many times shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? What he meant was, you know, a perfect amount of times, like a, you know, a countless number of times, a... You know, because he's not talking about literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. He's not talking about that. The word, the number seven is a complete, all-inclusive number. Okay. In other words, to make it to summarize it, Peter was saying, "Lord, how many times shall I forgive my my brother? How many times shall we forgive each other? Up to seven times. Completely, you know, eternally, all, you know, every time." inclusive of every time that they sin should we forgive everything all of everything inclusively completely absolutely i mean jesus could have said no one time twice you know, give him three three times in your own you know again seven times is not literally you know mathematically seven it means every time that's what it means verse 22 jesus said i don't tell you until seven times but until 70 times 70 times seven so mathematically, 490 times. If anybody, if you forgave somebody 490 times, I tell you, by, by, that, by, by the 489th time, you will have forgiveness uh, as a habit, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you won't be, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll have it down pat. You'll have it as an art by that time. Verse 23, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he had begun to settle... One was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Okay, so 10,000 talents, it says here in the notes, about 300 metric tons of silver represents an extremely large sum of money, equivalent to about 60 million denarii, where one denarius was typical of one day's wages for an agricultural labor, for agricultural labor. So that's... That's a lot. Of, that's a lot of money. You know, when he had begun to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. That's a lot of money. That is like more than anybody could ever earn in a lifetime. But because he couldn't pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold 
with his wife, his children, and all that he had, and payment be made. Verse 26, the servant therefore fell down and knelt before him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will repay you all. The Lord of that servant, being moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. Wow, that's a lot to forgive. Not just cut the debt, not just cut the debt in half or you know, charge him a tenth of it. Just for, totally forgave him the debt. Oh, forget about it. You owe me, you know, you owe me $50 billion. Forget about it. Verse 28, but that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. A hundred denarii was about one sixteenth of a talent or about 500 grams of silver. So a very small amount of money. Okay. So one servant but that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii and he grabbed him and took him by the throat. That means threatening to kill him, by the way, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down on his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me. I will repay you. That's exactly what that other servant said to his master. Exactly what he said. Verse 30, he would not but went and cast him into prison until he should pay back that which was due. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were exceedingly sorry and came and, came and, and told their, their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord called him in and said, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me? Shouldn't you have have?" had mercy on your fellow servant, even as I had mercy on you? His Lord was angry and delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay all that was due to him. Guess what? That's more than he could ever, he'd be there forever. So this is the bottom line here, my friends, this is the bottom line, verse 35. So my heavenly father will also do to you if you don't each forgive your brother from your hearts for his misdeeds. What does he mean by that? Let's back up again to verse 34. His Lord was angry and delivered him to the tormentors. That, I tell you, is a representation of the evil spirits. Many people today are being inflicted. They might say, oh, the devil's inflicting me. The devil's attacking me. The devil, this and that. They're being inflicted by evil spirits because they don't forgive. Because they keep on yapping about other people. They keep on holding things against other people. Well, don't you know what this guy did to this girl? Don't you know what? Shut up. I just forgive or else the father is not going to forgive you. And this is not talking about on judgment. Day. This is talking about now. Many people are walking the streets now with being inflicted by evil spirits. I don't care whether you're a believer or not. I don't care whether you're a Christian or an atheist or a Muslim. Doesn't matter. This is a universal law, like the law of gravity. This is a universal law. If you forgive, you will be forgiven. If you release other people, you yourself will be released. If you release other people, God will release you. Don't you want to be released today? Right now, right now, say, Father, show me those people I need to forgive. Show me their face. Show me their name. And as God shows you right now, say, God, say, Father, I forgive. And name them. Name that person. If you don't know the name, at least describe them. For, and be specific. What are you forgiving them for? Now, trust me. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Okay? Forgiveness is just letting them go free. Not holding them captive to that not holding that debt against them not holding that sin against them so 
you're not denying that, I mean, you are not forgetting it, although forgiveness can lead to forget, to be, you know, to forgetting, you know, and that's the, that's the greatest thing. You forgive and you forget. But just because you don't forget doesn't mean you didn't forgive. Forgiving is not a feeling. Forgiving is a decision. You need to decide securely. You need to decide. You need to make a final decision to forgive. In other words, don't hold that sin against them. Don't hold that debt against them. When you release them, God will release you and you will see blessing in many ways. Those evil spirits will leave. Though that sickness those disease will leave. You won't even you won't even have to ask. Some of you won't even have to ask God to heal you. God will just heal you. I have seen it before in my life. I have seen it. It's true. Right now. At the end of this video, pause everything. If you're at work, go somewhere alone. I don't care where it is. Go to <laughs> go to the washroom. Wherever you need to go. Go outside. Go somewhere. Take a break. And go through the list that God shows you in your mind, in your heart, of everybody you need to forgive. Let them go free, and you will be happier than you will ever be than you ever were, was in your life. You will be freer than you ever was in your life. Thanks for watching.